with the burning light of noon who is standing on the mountain who is on the earth
Good evening, Kensington Temple. Welcome to our 6 p.m. City Night service, where this evening we will have the last in our series of the seven I Ams of Jesus Christ. Who did he say he is? So I hope that you're excited to work through that very last one this evening. Some of you are joining and are already waiting with bated breath online. You're so welcome. You are part of our family. We thank you for joining us each week. And we want you to have a great experience right there in your home as well as we do here. For those of you who have managed to join us in our main hall, please stand to your feet because we're going to worship the Lord. And that is what we 
come here to do, isn't it? Week after week to give him our praise and to give him our adoration. Amen. Are we ready? Let's worship the Lord with Marenike and team. God bless you. Good evening, KT. Are we all excited to worship the Lord this evening? Are we all excited? The Word of God says that let their praises, let the praises of God fill their mouths because the praises are their weapons for war. So as we worship and as we praise today, let's remember that that is our weapon.
your love was greater. Was greater. Now nothing can separate. of 
the goodness of God. I love your voice. Your voice. You have led me through. You have led me through the fire. Dark is dark. You are close. Like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. As a friend. And I have lived in the good. He is good, isn't he? But earlier on I saw a vision. So I'm going to ask for the words to come up again of death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. And I'll ask the worship team to sing that kind of bridge again in a moment. But the word said death could not hold you, Jesus. The veil tore before you, you silenced the boast 
of sin and the boast of the grave. He said, the heavens are roaring the praise of your glory. And I saw it. I saw the heavens roaring. I saw everything ablaze. With his glory. With his glory. Such was the light. He said, for you are raised to life again. That means he died. But he overcame and he conquered. It says you have no rival. And as I saw the blazing heavens and the glory... None could match him. None could overpower him again. He said, you have no equal. There's none like you, Jesus Christ. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. And what? powerful name of Jesus. What a powerful name his name is. Conquered death. Conquered hell. Sin couldn't answer anymore. Let's sing that. Death could not hold you. Death could not hold you. The veil tore be as your Lord and Saviour in here this evening. But my hope and my prayer is that by the end of the evening, you will, for there is no power like the name of Jesus Christ. And there is no one above. He is the only one who took our sins, who died for us, who paid the price to set us free. There is none like him. Father, I praise you today for your son, Jesus Christ, the bread of life, the light of the world, the door. So many other things are declared in the Bible that you said you are. When you were asked, are you the son of God? You said, you say that I am. I pray that we be not fooled by the things of the world 
that we be not deceived by the things of the world. There's not the time anymore. There's not the time anymore. The time is now. The acceptable time is now for salvation. It is now for Jesus Christ is in glory, is in glory, seated at the right hand of the Father. There's none like him. It is a finished, completed work. Who, by the end of this evening, will he reveal himself to? Who will see him for who he really is? I pray his presence is with you right there in your homes. I pray that the Spirit of God is moving upon you, that he's moving in here, and that as he is declared as I am tonight, he will be revealed for who he is, and we will be changed in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Welcome to the 6 p.m. service. I'm just going to go through a few announcements, so um, it would be really good. Take some notes, because there's some typical in KT, there's some amazing things that are going to take place in the next coming weeks. First of all, let's celebrate, let's, let's question, I know there's one, is there any Sierra Leoneans in the house tonight? I think there's one in the back. And my brother at the back, well done. Are you mixed because only half of your arm was up? I'm playing. Bless your heart, my bro. Um, so the Sierra Leon Independence Celebration is taking place in Kensington Temple on Saturday, the 27th of April, 7 p.m. here at KT. Whether you're Sierra Leonean or not, you are invited because the Sierra Leoneans want to celebrate with us all. Amen. Now, from my memory, it was they were occupied by the UK 1961. So it should be 60, it should be their 63rd anniversary of independence. Hip hip hooray. 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 So yeah, that should be amazing. So I do encourage you, if you are free, that's the 27th of April, 7 p.m. at KT. It can it can also be found um, on page 19 on April's Revival Times. Next, missions trip to Marseille. Hallelujah. Okay, so those who are mission-minded, those who have been hearing from the Lord, or you have a thought in your heart, I really want to get involved in, in missions. Well, Kensington Temple are providing you an opportunity for that. The missions is called um, Freedom to Marseille. And basically, it will be an opportunity for those who are looking to get involved in missions to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ in Marseille. Uh, the price is £550. That includes flights, it includes accommodation, it includes meals. Um, with this price, I'm sure a massage as well. This is fantastic. So, um, no, it, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. But I do want to encourage you, if you are thinking to yourself, you know, I would love to um, grow in missions, in the sharing of the gospel. It is a great way. You need to understand the DNA of this house is to disciple, is to train, is to grow and to release. And sometimes, outside of all the studying, sometimes you just have to go, right? So we want to encourage you. This is a moment to go, and we are going to Marseille. So the trip actually takes place on the 8th to the 15th of July. And if you do want to register your interests, I want to encourage you to email missions at kt.org. That's missions at kt.org. Send them like your name and, and they'll contact you. And um, I really want to encourage you because uh, missions is, is a great thing. It's a great way to grow. Wednesday prayer meetings. I've been banging the drum for this. Every Wednesday prayer meeting is fantastic. Last week we were talking about um, the four soils, the state of the heart. Those in the congregation, we were really praying into the states of our hearts, not just individually, but as a congregation. And we just want to encourage you to attend this Wednesday's prayer meeting. Again, Wednesday the 24th, 7 p.m. as normal. God's going to move. God's going to speak. And I really want to encourage you, those who aren't comfortable with prayer, Come. So many people learn to pray when you're in an environment where prayer takes place. So be a part of it. And I'm very, I'm going to encourage you that God is going to do something. So uh, I encourage you, be there. To the men, there is a special men's 
gathering with a gentleman called Pastor Larry Titus. Um, this man is the real deal. He's had 60 years worth of ministry. He is the founder with his wife of a ministry called Kingdom Global Ministries and his speciality is in discipleship. He grows men, he grows women of God in the things of God and in the things of life, um, be it in marriage success, personal life success, but success in God's eyes. So he is coming down and his, his message really on that night is the fatherhood of God. So this is going to take place on Wednesday the 8th of May, 7 p.m., this is for the men only. Men only. So if you know a man or if you are a man, encourage them to be there and they're going to have a great time. And if you are a woman, feel free to ask us how it went after. Amen. Okay, I just want to introduce the worship team to come back to the platform. And we're just really going to engage really now in a time of, of, of offering and, and, and giving thanks to God. In this moment, the stewards will come down the aisle and they will offer you a white envelope if you can't find one on your chair at the moment. For those who are online, there is a link for you to click on and for you to use as an opportunity to give, to, um, to give a tithe, to give an offering or an expression of your thanks to God. I want to engage you all in this Bible verse, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 17. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. I'll say it again. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. This is a wonderful Old Testament verse. But let's take this Old Testament verse and connect it to this New Testament verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18. And it reads... Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You see, brothers and sisters, God's desire isn't just for you to give, to, to give right? This time of, of offering is a moment where we're saying, Lord, with this monetary, whatever the monetary gift it is, we're saying, Lord, we're saying thank you. We're saying thank you for being you. Thank you for giving us what you've given us. And I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that this goes more than what you're going through. You see, when we give thanks to God, we're really saying, God, ultimately, you are good. You have blessed me with every spiritual blessing in, in the heavenly places. And I also want to encourage you on this one thing as well. When you give thanks, it keeps your eyes on Jesus. And when your eyes are on Jesus, it leaves your heart open to receive God's grace. So when God encourages you to give thanks and, 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 and we use this opportunity to, to give, I want you to know this. You're never going to be out of pocket when you allow your heart to be in God's pocket. Hallelujah. I want to encourage everyone, no matter what you're going through, your situation, don't allow your situation to speak more than Jesus' blood for your life. You are blessed. You're a royal priesthood. You've been called overcomers if you partake in the divine nature that is in each and every one of us. And as we sing, let's sing in celebration and let's give with thanks knowing that we have been called to overcome every and all things in Jesus' name. Let's stand and worship our God.
Let's have, a, let's have a, a big round of applause to Jesus in the worship team. Hallelujah. Uh, I'd like you all to take a seat. I forgot something. I did. And how could I forget? Katie Hobb, Young Adults, which I'm in charge of. Um, we have an event this Friday. Um, this Friday at 7 p.m. at Kensington Temple. It's called Spiritual Promotion. And the idea is it's a night of prayer. Um, and deliverance from certain things that are holding us back. It's really based on Daniel chapter 3, when it talks about um, Daniel, Sh um, uh, Meshach, Abednego, and Shadrach. There you go. And they're in the fire, and long story short, the fire burns all, all the way there. They're, they're bound in chains, and they're free. And Daniel says, um, um, Nebuchadnezzar says, um, in verse 30, he says, Surely God has delivered you. And as a result, he promoted them, not because of who they were, but the God they served. And the idea is we're encouraging the young adults of this church to come into the place of prayer and to allow God to spiritually promote them so they can function in the place that God's called them to function in. Amen? Amen. And it is with my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, the man of God for this evening's message, Pastor Scott. Thanks, Bill. Thank you very much, Pastor Andrew. 
So we are closing out our series tonight on the seven I am declarations of Jesus that you can find in John's gospel. And the title of the sermon tonight is Fruit Bearing Discipleship. So we're going to be in John 15 verses 1 to 11. And we arrive at this point in the final I am in, of Jesus. And all of the I am's point to Jesus. And they in turn fuel and facilitate a crucial and central kingdom principle for us as disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's how do we actually now use all that we've learned through those seven I am's about who Jesus is, about what he is revealing to us through his word, through his heart, through his nature. And it all actually arrives at fruit-bearing discipleship, how we become more like Jesus. And so our awareness and our acceptance of Jesus and the seven I am's must reveal and produce something of God's kingdom. Otherwise, we're simply left with spiritually strong significant information, but no mechanism, no methodology with which to actually put it into use in our daily lives. This is where John 15 stands strong and stands alone. So if you have your Bibles, John 15 verses 1 to 11, the words from the ESV will appear on the screen. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the words that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, whatever you ask, whatever you wish, it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that your joy, my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. And the context to John 15 is crucial because Jesus at this point is beginning to prepare his faithful, dedicated disciples for the upcoming trials and tests that are guaranteed to emerge in their lives. And for anyone that is sold out for Jesus Christ, passionate for the things of God, you will go through similar trials and tests. It is evidenced right there at the start of the early church and has continued ever since. And it is absolutely visible to anyone who is striving and seeking to stand on biblical truths, not to endorse the things of this world, not to compromise, not to be lukewarm, not to abdicate your integrity. And the current circumstances and climate for the disciples is not encouraging or affirming. They've just left the upper room. Judas has betrayed, uh, uh, Judas has abandoned them. Jesus has just informed them that he is about to have his own death and he is leaving them. He promises that the Holy Spirit will be there, but they haven't even seen the fullness of that promise yet. Not a perfect scenario to start discipling people in. And so they start their journey, walking through Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. But imagine for a moment being one of those disciples. Your hope is fragile. Your confidence may be eroding. Your trust is languishing. Your disillusionment is setting in. Your disappointment is already present. Why? The person who you've walked with and journeyed with is about to leave you. He's about to go to the cross. 
And you know, even in that moment, as a disciple of Jesus, they would have spent lots of time in the open terrain, sleeping quite literally under the stars, ready for another bleak and cold night as they make their journey. What is Jesus doing? With incredible devotion and dedication, he is continuing to teach and train him. He is faultless and faithful to the very end. And yet Jesus must have been considering his own death, the pain, the anguish, the sorrow, the trauma that he would be going through himself. And yet, as we all know, but sometimes forget, Jesus' care and concern is always primarily for us, his disciples. That is the love of Jesus. That is the love of the Father. We read in the previous chapter in John 14, the opening words often used at a funeral declare as follows, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. How many of us know that is often easier said than done because life happens. But just because it's hard doesn't make it not possible. Perspective is always key. Being able to see the greater, bigger picture, knowing and understanding your destiny in Jesus Christ. And Jesus reinforces this later in John 14 in verse 27 where he declares, peace I leave with you. My peace I leave with you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And right before we turn to John 15, the last words of John 14 ring true. Come now, let us leave. Now we don't know why, we don't necessarily know how, but Jesus decides to use the illustration of a vine. And vineyards were and still very commonplace in Israel at that time, and he likely would have been using a physical, literal example on the side of a road, perhaps, that they were walking through to show his disciples a perfect example of how they can stay connected to God. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. The implication already is that Jesus is aware of the fact that there are other vines that may be claiming to be something or someone that they are not. In that time, religious structures and systems of that day orientated around Judaism and the totality of one's religious life was totally tethered to a temple or a church building. Nothing more than a fleeting picture of who Jesus truly is. Jesus was trying to make the distinction between that and who he is. Jesus is the life. He is the source of all creation. Nothing was made without him. John 1 tells us that. He is the lamb that was sacrificed for the sins of the world. He is the rock in the wilderness where the living water comes from. He is the perfect manna from heaven. He is the light of the world. He is the source of health and life for his bride, us, the church. He's also the word of God. John is the only book to reference Jesus in a pre-mortal state. And yet right there in verse one, my father is the vine dresser. God does the work in our lives, amen? Often we've got to get out of our own way and let God be God in our own lives. He doesn't need our our effort. He doesn't need our input. He needs our willingness, and he needs our obedience. And what you can see in verse 5 is that Jesus is confirming and clarifying that the branches are his disciples. We are permanently, inextricably linked to the Father. Amen? That is the hallmark of a loving Father, that he will never let us go. We are permanently connected to him. But in that story, you can see that there are ultimately two types of branches, fruitful ones and unfruitful ones. This would tell us that there are ultimately maybe two types of believers, fruitful believers and fruitless believers. And I believe if you're here in this house for any period of time, you cannot not be anything other than a fruitful believer in Jesus Christ. Amen? Verse 5 tells us, ultimately, that that is the people he's speaking to there are the believers. Verse 6 is referencing the unbelievers. They are the ones not abiding. But take a moment to look back to verse 2. 
What does Jesus actually say? He says the words, in me. He's explicitly referencing those in Christ, those who belong to Christ. He's speaking to believers. And you can see in verse 6 the the reality of him speaking to non-believers. And when he says he takes something away, the accurate Greek translation is actually the word ero, a I R O. And what it means to actually, it's today's word it would be to lift something up, to elevate something, to raise something, to lift it up from where it was to where it should be. And the reason that some of us may be not producing fruit in our lives is that we're lying on the ground, we're low lying, we're drooping. And that is always natural in the natural realm for those branches because they are not being exposed to the sunlight, the light. Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, the master gardener, the vine dresser, needs to lift up the unfruitful believers to help them become fruitful, which means greater exposure to the light. Jesus Christ himself is the light of the world. Fruitfulness in Christ and for his kingdom is always a direct result of maturity, discipline, and an ongoing willingness to be used by God. God is always wanting to do a deep work in our hearts and lives. He wants to shape us. He wants to refine us. But it's all in Christ. We're not exempt from that if we are a believer. And I want to encourage you to always embrace every opportunity that God gives you to bear fruit for his kingdom. Never avoid God's ways of maturing you because he wants you to walk into the fullness, into the freedom of all that he has for you. So wherever you go, in whatever season and scenario and circumstance you're in, you will reflect the fullness and fruitfulness of Jesus Christ to each and every person. And when they look at you, they're going to say, what is different about this individual? And what is different about you is that you are in Christ and you are being fruitful for Christ so the extension of his kingdom can come in and through your life. But also, isn't it wonderful when God cleanses us? Amen? We should always welcome every opportunity where he wants to prune our lives. He cleans or he prunes the branches that bear fruit. Every branch bearing fruit he prunes so that it can bear more fruit. God will cut us back, but God will never cut us off. Amen? That is what a master gardener does. You would never cut off in the practical, natural world a branch that was bearing fruit. You would cut it back so it would bear more fruit. They cleanse the branches to produce more fruit. But if you've ever been cut back in your life, if you've ever been pruned in your life, it can feel painful. You wonder what's going on. You you challenge it. You're, You're uncomfortable with it. But recognize this. It always serves a purpose. That might be slightly harder for me, but have you ever gone to the hairdresser and you've asked the hairdresser, can you just give me just a little cut? And they cut off more than they should. It's not difficult for me, but maybe a little harder for you. And you walk out of there, and they always hold the mirror behind you and say, are you happy? And it's like, I don't have a choice at this point. (laughs) So yes, I'm happy. But they cut off more than you expect. And you're thinking, that's a bit harsh. Wasn't quite ready for that. But praise God for some of us that are not follically challenged. It's going to grow back. Just trust the process. It's not a word of knowledge for any bold people. I'm sorry. That is not a prophetic word that your hair will grow back. In Jesus' name be blessed. But that's the reality. Some of us are still getting that, okay? Bless you. Receive that word. It serves a purpose. We have to recognize every time God cuts us back, it's so that we grow and bear more fruit. He's not trying to restrict or or somehow limit our fruitfulness. He's wanting you to be more fruitful. And that doesn't mean you doing more. It means you being more like Jesus. This is not works. This is your heart before God. 
And the word declares, by the word that has, I have spoken to you. God will always use situations and seasons in your daily walk to bring you to a point and place where the infallible word of God will cleanse and renew you. Amen? We know Hebrews 11 is the, the, the great chapter, the hall of fame of faith men and women of God in the Bible, but Hebrews 12 tells us at the end of verse 1, in verse 2, we can look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, enduring the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of the Father. God's work does the pruning in our lives. And so I want you to take a moment and ask yourself, when did the word of God last prune you? When did you last open this book and a verse, a story, an example jumped out at you and you were just like, whoa, this is applicable. This just cuts right past the pride, the ego, all the insecurities you may have and speaks right into a situation in your life that has the opportunity to totally change the trajectory of your destiny in your walk with Jesus Christ. This word here is sharper than any two-edged sword. It can do the work that it needs to do if you give it the space, the opportunity, and the freedom to do what it needs to do. The great Timothy Keller said, look at Jesus Christ. Every time he was in trouble, he used the word of God when he was tempted, he used the word. When he was suffering on the cross, he used the word. The purpose and the goal of our lives and our hearts is to become more like Jesus. We must be conformed into his image and proactively remove the things that hamper us from moving forward with God. And if you've had any semblance of a journey with Jesus, you will have encountered and experienced great joy, disappointment, Heartache, loss, pain, suffering, victory, breakthrough. And yet, amidst the rubble of the discouraging moments of your life, the power of God's word still shines through. Our Father is a loving Father. He is full of love, full of care, full of concern for our lives, so much so that he wants us to bear more fruit. So what is this fruit that he is ultimately referring to? Jesus doesn't even take the time to confirm or allude to it because it has already been established in the Old Testament. You can see many times in many chapters, in many books in the Old Testament, the word vine being used, particularly in Isaiah 5. It's 30, 31 verses long. Read it in your own time. The Lord's vineyard was being destroyed and it is eloquently expressed to each and every one of us. But even then, the prophet declares when he came to Israel and he looked at the vineyard, he was looking for fruit and fruit is justice and righteousness. But what did he find? He found people that were out for themselves. But here's the reality. 2 Corinthians 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Take a moment to accept and absorb that truth. Every single day that you and I wake up and we get to put on the best of who we are in Jesus, we are being transformed more and more from glory to glory into the image and likeness of God. The ultimate fruit that you are to bear is to become the image of God. That's the fruit that God is looking for. And to be a disciple of Jesus, you must become like Jesus. That alone is bearing fruit. That goes more than just attracting people to come to church, more than simply leading, to people, leading people to Jesus. It's about discipling those people. More people, yes, but more people who are like Christ. How do we achieve this? The answer is in verses 4 and 5 of John 15. Abide in me. The word abide sometimes translates dwell. It's where you take up 
residence. It's not somewhere that you pass through like a petrol station and move on. You actually take up residence. You dwell, you abide, you, you, you set up your home. Everything around your life is orientated to that place or that person. Are we abiding in Jesus Christ? Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. We must have Christ in us if we are going to be like Christ. We cannot have a superficial, shallow, or surface level spirituality. You're going to get found out. There is nothing engaging or attractive to us from the people in the world. They will look at our lives, they will look at how we conduct ourselves, and they will see no difference between their life and our life. But if we are in Christ, if we are abiding in him, we have something that is different, and we are able then to reach people for Jesus Christ. Power of the Holy Spirit. The great theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, because I am a Christian, therefore every day in which I do not penetrate more deeply into the knowledge of God's word in Holy Scripture is a lost day for me. I can only move forward with certainty upon the firm ground of the word of God. And as a Christian, I learn to know the scriptures in no other way than by hearing the word of God preached and by prayerful meditation. And the last uh, verses 4 and 5, uh, the last, sorry, the last four verses of John 15, verse, the last four or five verses of the 11 verses that I was referencing capture the principles and the attributes that we need to demonstrate fruit in our life. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. What a promise. What a promise. Whatever you wish. No excuses, no extenuating circumstances, no explanations, nothing. No exemptions. First proof of a fruitful life is the fullness and the favor of answered prayer life. You become a powerful, rich source of prayer. Now we know James declares that it's the prayers of the righteous man that produces great results. And we love that second part. But the first quality, the only attribute that James actually requests for that to be true is that it's the prayers of the righteous. God always hears the prayers of the righteous. The more you abide in him, the more his word is rooted in you, the more you will receive what you ask for. Praise, prayer, and his promises are all interlinked in Scripture. Prayer is nothing more than you and I communicating with God the way I am speaking to you now. Praise is a weapon that defeats discouragement and builds faith. And every promise is yes and amen for those who are in Christ. We should always pray according to his promises, not our preferences. Verse 8, by this, by what? By everything we've just read in verse 7. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. The righteousness that is on display in your life will produce the fruit. You cannot produce fruit in yourself. Your life of righteousness to and before God will be a living, active testimony of the transformational power of God working in and through your life each and every day. And I guarantee you, after time, people are going to see it and they're going to notice it. And they're going to make comments to you like, you're different. And in a, that's in a good way, not a bad way. Amen? Because God is working in your life. Verses 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You have a free will choice today. 
if you. The freedom and the flexibility to keep his commandments are entirely ours. However, I would strongly suggest to you that if you ultimately do love him, you will find it easy to keep his commandments. They are not burdensome. 1 John 5 verse 3 declares, For this is the love of God, that if we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. The more you abide in the Father's love, the more love is produced in your life. Your love for God will always produce obedience to God. And the fruit of love is that you ensure you keep his commandments, reflecting Christ, who, by the way, kept every single one of his Father's commandments. And so if Jesus is able to do that, we are able to do this. Verse 11, these things... I have spoken to you that my joy, my joy, not your joy in you, his joy in you, my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. The final principle, attribute to cultivate tonight is having God's joy in our lives. Because when God's joy is in our lives, our own joy is full. What was Jesus' joy? As I read in Hebrews 12, verse 2, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Jesus had a heart full of joy not because of the impending pain, trauma, suffering that he would go through, but because he knew that he was the answer to the sins of the world. And everything that he achieved at Calvary has enabled generation after generation after generation, including you and I here today, to live in that freedom, in that restoration, in that redemption. That brought joy to his heart. That's the hallmark of a loving father. His ultimate joy was actually being a clean, willing, empty vessel being used by God. Joy. The more we abide in Christ, the more we will experience his love, his joy, and his peace. And unless you you possess a joy in Jesus... I guarantee you, I guarantee you, your joy is not full. We must become totally dependent on God. And so the more connected we stay to the vine, the more fruit we produce. Healthy fruit will always emerge in your life. But for that to be true, the word of God has to be able to speak into our lives. You know, I know many Christians, they know the word of God. They can quote chapter and verse to me, but they like to rip pages out that they don't like, that cuts across their preferences. If we accept this word of God, we accept all of it. Every page, every word, every verse, every chapter, every book, Old and New Testament, no exceptions. That is what makes it infallible, that it was God-breathed, amen? And there's too many of us as Christians, we, we pick and choose what we think is accurate or even relevant to our daily walk. The great author John Stott said the following, we must allow the word of God to confront us, to disturb our security, to undermine our complacencies, and to overthrow our patterns of thought and behavior. And I believe for some of us, probably all of us in this place, we all need some pruning in our lives if we want to continue to grow and bear fruit. And the evidence for that is really simple. Have you ever thought in a moment in your life, what is going on? Where are you, God? Why is this happening? Why me? Why not him or her? God is trying to birth more fruit in you. Never avoid God's ways of maturing you. We've got to live a life of obedience to him, trusting in him, knowing in him, and take heart. 
There is a purpose to the pruning. He loves you enough to do this. Understand this, it wasn't that you weren't already being fruitful. It is simply an invitation and an opportunity to bear more fruit. It involves pruning, breaking. It may be painful. You probably won't like it. Be encouraged. It has a deeper spiritual purpose. Shift your perspective beyond the natural to the supernatural and be assured in time, growth will emerge in your life. And know this, the pruning will always be done by the tender, loving care of the master gardener, Jesus Christ himself. He knows exactly what to do to prune. It's not like those gardening shows where you walk in and they look and they don't know what to cut, so they cut everything. He knows exactly what to cut out of your life. He knows exactly what to prune back so that you can be more fruitful for him. The question, the invitation to you tonight is, do you want to be more fruitful tonight? I believe it's an opportunity for each and every one of us to take a look at our own walk, our own journey with Jesus and say, Lord, here I am. I want to abide in you and I know that you will abide in me. And as a result of that, you have the permission, you have the authority, the autonomy to prune me back in whatever area of my life that needs pruning because I want to bear fruit. I want to be the best expression of Jesus that I can be everywhere I go. If that's you tonight, I want to encourage you to stand. You may stand on your own, and that's fine, but you need to hear the word of God tonight, and you need to ask yourself, where is your love? Where is your loyalty? If you want to grow as a Christian, it starts and stops with willingness and obedience to submit and surrender to the word of God. And so maybe you're here today and you're not ready to stand. And what you're saying to me with the greatest of respect is I'm not ready to grow yet. I'm not ready to move forwards anymore. And that's okay. But I don't know about you. I want to grow. I want to keep becoming more like Jesus each and every day. And so if anything that I've said has resonated, I want to encourage you to stand or you can bow your head, close your eyes, whatever is healthy, appropriate, relative for you. But my prayer is that this has really spoken into your heart. That maybe in these moments that I've been speaking, you've been examining and exploring your own life, reflecting and assessing and appraising your own life in relation to the word of God that I've just preached tonight. And you're saying, you know what? I know there's more. I know there's more. I know that I can be more like Jesus. I can be more righteous. I can be more godly. I can be more kind. I can be more caring. Whatever it is that you feel and sense that God is speaking to you. But can I implore you, please, don't retreat. Don't recoil from what the Word of God is calling you to do. It never changes. People change. Times and seasons change, but God never changes. He is unfailing. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And you can put your trust and your confidence in him tonight, knowing that he will never fail you. He will never let you down. He will never abandon you. That what might look painful in the natural is a process that will shape and mold and, 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 and cultivate the most fruitful season of your life. And the goal of every person who declares Jesus Christ as their Lord is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's to reflect him. And even now as I'm sharing, I'm reminded of the words that Paul wrote at the start of Ephesians 5. He says, therefore, be imitators of Christ in all that you do offering up a sweet fragrance and sacrifice for the love that you have found in him. To be an imitator. It means to duplicate, to replicate. If you think about fancy dress parties, dressing up as your favorite superhero or something like that, the, always the one that was most accurate to the original 
would win. That's the goal, to become most like the original, and the original is Jesus. And so in the stillness of your own heart and mind, I have only really two questions. Are you abiding? Are you truly abiding in Him? Because the Word of God is infallible. So if you are truly abiding in Him, you are bearing fruit for Him. So if you're struggling to see where the fruit is in your life, I would encourage you to trace it back to, well, how much am I abiding in Him? You can't have a fleeting visit on a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday morning or at your cell meeting. If you're abiding somewhere, as I said earlier, it means to dwell, to encamp, to take up residence. It means that you're there 24-7, 365. It's in those conditions that you will bear fruit. And my second question is, for your own consideration, in your own heart, where, where do you need pruning? And yes, my question presupposes that pruning is necessary. The Word of God declares that. What needs to be pruned in your life? It's a two-edged question, I guess, in some ways. There could be things that need to be pruned away from our lives, cut away. But really, what he's trying to say is, what does he need to cut back? Where are you giving your time, your attention, your affection? What dominates your thoughts day by day, week by week? What keeps you awake at night as your heart aches for people in your life that you know are going to hell because they do not yet know Jesus? Tonight is, is simply an invitation to come to the altar to come into the presence and the power of God. And it's true for all of us. We probably all need to abide more. To abandon those places and things and people that steal our time and our effort and our energy and our enthusiasm. And dwell where He is. And that we trade what we think is our joy for His joy that your joy when you leave this place tonight is that I am being used by God. Yes, maybe in your marketplace. Yes, your boss may be difficult. Yes, you may be surrounded in your workplace by atheists and it may be hard to bring the gospel in. But praise God, my joy is His joy and that I am being used by Him in that moment to bring the light and the truth of Jesus Christ. The Word of God here is so clear. It's everything. It's all or nothing. If you abide in Him, you produce much fruit. Without Him, you can do nothing. Zero. Nothing registers in the spiritual, supernatural realm. Because it is not of God. It is a man-made construct. It is our own intellect, our own wisdom, our own ideas. It's only when you abide in Him that you produce fruit of the kingdom for the kingdom. And so in the stillness of your own heart, I ask those two questions again. And in a moment, the worship team are going to join me on the platform. And we're going to respond in song. Come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. And you think about a branch on a tree, that's exactly what it is. Are you abiding in the presence of God? And what needs pruning in your life? May the Holy Spirit lead you, illuminate the answers, guide you right now as I invite Katie Worship up. And then if you want to come forward to the front just to rededicate your heart, your life, areas of your life to God, 
you are most welcome. And I would encourage as many of you as possible to do that because it's an outward response to what is already an inward conviction that the Holy Spirit will give you as we learn as men and women of God to abide in Him. He will abide in us and in Him we will produce much fruit, fruit-bearing discipleship. In Jesus' name, amen.
Christ to the King of glory. want us to stay focused right now I'm not going to end it right now because I believe God wants to do deeper things you see the message that you heard is a very hard message to, to accept everybody loves the supernatural we want the hands laid we want people to fall on the floor we want people to be healed we want people speaking in tongues we want all of these things true but in my limited years of being a Christian I've seen many of these things and people stand and they stand the same those who hear this call of discipleship are saying no longer my way they're not saying I'll do church quarter time and then the other three quarters is down to me no it's Jesus saw nothing and the irony to this all is that when we go all to heaven believers we will be challenged and God will ask, what did you do with Pastor Scott's message today? Did you hear it and go outside and say, yeah, it was a good message, great message, lovely. Or did you say, I responded? There's two people in front in the altar. The whole church should be here. I want everyone to close their eyes. God wants your life to be fruitful beyond what you know beyond what you've experienced for those who can look at your life right now and say is it all that it can be concerning his fruit in me and if there is room for more and you're able come to the front get to a point when you're tired of doing church and you're excited about revealing Christ there is a response God wants us to make and often in that response our bodies often look like we're seated or kneeled and we're saying Lord take it all and anyone who is brave enough to fall on their knees or sit back down and say truly take it all those ones will be given the kingdom so I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ those seated here in this church and those who are watching online for this moment this is a burning bush moment what are you going to do in this moment are you going to walk away or are you going to come draw closer to him and respond and say take it all so your fruit can be seen I pray right now in the name of Jesus that your decision is no to self and yes to him no to the norm and yes to more fruit for his glory and I pray that as this worship team ministers to you right now God touches your heart 
and that response is made and the beginning of fruit be formed in your life in Jesus name
people are giving their lives to Jesus Christ tonight for the first time making a commitment others are saying Lord don't take some of me take all of me everything I am everything I have I surrender. There's a deep surrendering taking place. God's power is here to heal broken hearts and heal physical bodies. So at home lay hands on any area of your body at home right now if you need a healing touch from the Lord at home fire of God burn away every disease fire of God burn away every disease fire of God burn away every disease every heartache every pain in your precious name right here just put your hands in the air if you need a healing touch from the Lord come come forward if you need a healing touch from the Lord right here right here so a little bit longer but if you need to go home now if you want to be released you're released in the name of Jesus Christ remember 
the different announcements that were made. Please come to the prayer meeting. We're going to be really praying for our senior people this Wednesday. We're going to be praying into their lives and into what God has for the seniors in our society. So come and join us on Wednesday evening. Come to the Sierra Leone night on Saturday and celebrate with them and join us for our services next week. We will have baptism services at 9 and 11. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So God bless you all, but if you want to remain and receive some prayer, then please do. God bless you there at home. I believe you've received healing and we want to hear the testimony of such things. Don't forget the Hub event if you're 18 to 30s this Friday evening at 7 p.m. right here in Kensington Temple. God bless you. Standing on the mount Who is on the earth below Who is bigger than the heavens And the lover of my soul Sing that one time Who is moving on the wall Is holding up the moon. Who's sitting by the dark with a burning light of noon? Who's standing on the mountain? Who is on the earth? Who's moving on the walls? Who's holding up the moon? Who is peeling back the dogs with the burning light of noon? Who is standing on the mound? Who is on the earth below? Who is bigger than the heavens? 
and the lover of my soul. Sing that one time. Who is moving on the wall? Who is holding up the moon? With a burning light of noon Who is standing on the mountain Who is on the earth Who's moving on the wall? Who's holding up the moon? Who is peeling back the dark with the burning light of noon? Who is standing on the mound? Who is on the earth below? Who is bigger than the heavens? And the lover of my soul. Sing that one time. Who is moving on the wall? Who is holding up the moon? With a burning light of noon Who is standing on the mountain Who is on the earth
who's moving on the rocks, who's holding up the moon, who is peeling back the dogs with the burning light of noon. Who is standing on the mount? Who is on the earth below? Who is bigger than the heavens? And the lover of my soul. Sing that one time. Who is moving on the wall? Is holding up the moon. Who's feeling by the dark with a burning light of noon? Who's standing on the mountain? Who is on the earth? Who's moving on the rocks? Who's holding up the moon? Who is peeling back the dogs with the burning light of noon? Who is standing on the mountain? Who is on the earth below? Who is bigger than the heavens? And the lover of my soul. Sing that one time. Who is moving on the walls? Who is holding up the moon? With a burning light of noon Who's standing on the mountain Who is on the earth
who's moving on the wall who's holding up the moon who is peeling back the dogs with the burning light of noon who is standing on the mound Who is on the earth below? Who is bigger than the heavens? And the lover of my soul. Sing that one time. Who is moving on the wall? Who is holding up the moon? With a burning light of noon Who is standing on the mountain Who is on the earth Who's moving on the walls? Who's holding up the moon? Who is peeling back the dogs with the burning light of noon? Who is standing on the mound? Who is on the earth below? Who is bigger than the heavens? And the lover of my soul. Sing that one time. Who is moving on the wall? Who is holding up the moon? With a burning light of noon Who is standing on the mountain Who is on the earth
who's moving on the walls, who's holding up the moon, who is peeling back the dogs with the burning light of noon. Who is standing on the mound? Who is on the earth below? Who is bigger than the heavens? And the lover of my soul. Sing that one time. Who is moving on the wall? Is holding up the moon. He's feeling by the dark with a burning light of noon. Who is standing on the mountain? Who is on the earth? Below? 